Jamie's really giving me a run for my money for getting here the last second. Yeah. Oh, he's got it. You mean Jamie? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to call to order the Cape Elizabeth Town Council special meeting for April 29, 2013. And I would ask the clerk to read the roll. Chairman Walsh? Here. Councilor Gouvenali? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Sullivan? Here. And Councilor Wagner? Here. Thank you. If I have everyone would rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of, of the United States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item would be Town Council reports and correspondence. Jessica? I'd like to report that the uh, Library Planning Committee had its first meeting recently. Our, our next one is tomorrow. It was very successful, and uh, Molly McCausland was elected chairman. And so work has begun, and it's very, uh, very hopeful. Good. Well, thank you for that update. Are there any other council reports or correspondence? Anything? No? Okay. Hearing none, we'll uh, go to the first item on today's agenda, which is a citizen's opportunity for a discussion of items that are not on the agenda. There are agendas in the back of the room. If those of you who haven't seen what's on today's agenda, you want to step back there and pick up a copy. Well, I think that was a good decision. Uh, <laughs> good. So this piece right now that we're talking about, if, if the item is not on today's agenda, if you would like to address us, we're happy to listen to you. And if so, if you would uh, step over to the podium, introduce yourself. Looks like we don't have anyone who wishes to do that. OK. So moving on to uh, the town manager's report. Michael? Yes, uh, thank you. <coughs> I just wanted to uh, let you know I had a uh, visit today from a forest entomologist with the Department of Conservation, a uh, woman by the name of Charlene Donahue. And she came to talk about winter moth. I think everyone might recall that back in November and December, we had all these little white moths that suddenly were all over Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and at that time, there were some newspaper <coughs> articles which uh, indicated that it might be a problem come the spring. Well, it apparently, uh, They've been doing testing in Cape Elizabeth, and uh, where we have the potential of a large winter moth problem. Uh, in that, these these moths, when they uh, come out in the spring, uh, defoliate trees and uh, almost all of the hardwood trees. Uh, so, folks are probably likely to begin to see uh, holes in their leaves just as they're coming out. They're already going into the buds even before the buds come out. The good news is, is, is that they, there aren't enough of them to do every tree. And they, and, you know, they get fed so they don't do a whole tree sometimes. But uh, th this is an issue that's particularly happened. Uh, they've seen it quite uh, predominantly <coughs> in eastern Massachusetts, uh, where, where it's been a problem for uh, you know, about a decade now. And it's, in Maine, it is limited to the immediate coast. And she showed me a map of where they got complaints about the winter moths. And, uh, she, made, she, she said it's basically on this side of Route 1. But even in Cape Elizabeth, you can see that there were more issues uh, along the coast. They, they're, they're being seen in Maine from uh, Kittery all the way to Bar Harbor. But she said <coughs> Cape Elizabeth and Hopswell do seem to be sort of ground zero for these, for the, uh, these moths. You know, the, the, the good news, if there is any good news, is that they they only uh, defoliate trees, unlike the, the, the uh, brown moth, gypsy, what's it called, the brown? The brown, the brown, the brown something or other, which actually causes infections uh, and, you know, it's painful to people. The, these moths are only hurt the trees. Uh, you know, people don't get <coughs> rashes and that sort of thing. Uh, the, the only way to really 
deal with it, she said, is to, they, they bring in this fly, and the flies come from uh, British Columbia, and they, they put them out, uh, you know, to, and then they, they eat, uh, it's a biological control, they, they eat the, the moss. Uh, the, the problem is, is you can't buy these commercially, we just can't go to British Columbia and buy them. Uh, you know, they're, they're controlled. And Maine was able to get a hold of 10,000 of these flies uh, from Massachusetts. Uh, for whatever reason, Massachusetts was able to, to give Maine some of them, the flies. Uh, and, but 10,000 flies to be released between Kittery and Bar Harbor, you know, aren't a whole lot in order to take care of the issue. They do plan to release them in Two Light State Park uh, as, as a spot in Cape Elizabeth. I encourage her also to look possibly around Fort Williams to do a, one in the, the northern end along the coast and one in the southern end. Uh, <coughs> she said they'd already done permitting, there are, other, there are other issues, it may not be possible. But the, you know, the bottom line of all this is, is that folks probably will see just as soon as the leaves come out, uh, leaves being eaten, holes in leaves, and not as healthy leaves on our trees. Uh, you know, it, it's not a good thing. Uh, you know, particularly for a community that values its its forest stock, and uh, you know we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, uh, you know the state is looking more into it and seeing about supplies. I asked, and I specifically asked, could we go to, you know, could we get them out of British Columbia? And her answer, it was she came in late this afternoon. Uh, the answer was no, that you know communities can't do that. Uh, but anyway, just wanted to make you aware of it because you know particularly over the next month you'll probably have citizens approach you. Uh, asking, you know, what's the town doing? And, you know, we, we, you know hopefully by, you know, mentioning this tonight, uh, you know, that the state will be forthcoming in the press and otherwise to let citizens know what's going on. And it might, uh, you know, we will find out more as time goes on. I do have some things here if you want them. The pest alert from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which explains them in another sheet that she gave me. Uh, describing the winter moth and how it happened to come about. But, you know, they were a little bit pretty when they were here last fall, all those little white flickers, but uh, they're going to cause some damage. So, Good. Frank? Mike, does the defoliation or partial defoliation lead to the death of the tree? It, it could eventually. Uh, in Massachusetts, they've had, you know, generally they have, <coughs> they have been stands of trees where, they, where they're particularly aggressive and after a while the, the trees will die and is it necessarily recurring if we get it one year we necessarily we get it the next year or? it you know in europe where these things came from they tended to go in two to three year cycles but here in in, in well in eastern massachusetts once they came in they <coughs> they haven't been following that same pattern so uh you know the, the there is hope you know they the, the flies seem to be improving mm -hmm. The, the situation in, in Massachusetts. And I asked about these flies. They're not the green-headed ones. They're not, you know, they're, they're not flies that will cause other types of problems that are known. That's what I was going to ask. So. Hmm? Is it next year gonna, our problem going to be the British Columbia fly? Infestation? I don't know. But one other, just one, I know we've got to get to the budget hearing, but one other interesting thing, she said, but how did it come to Maine? And she said, you know, very likely it was from landscapers or individuals who brought soils and material from Massachusetts up to here. Uh, you know, landscaping material, whatever. So, you know, it, particularly if Cape Elizabeth residents have, you know, properties inland, you know, you'd be strongly advised not to take anything from your property in the ground or whatever to, to any inland property because that could help it to spread inland as well. Thank you, Michael. One other up update. Um, a lot of citizens calling and asking what's happening with uh, all of the uh, trees around power lines. Yeah. Could you give us an update on that? Yeah, Central Maine Power uh, has been concerned for a number of years about the number of power outages in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, they have a regular tree trimming program that they do throughout their territory. And uh, they have, you know, focused of late on the communities where there's been, uh, you know, more examples of power outages. And for, I think most Cape Elizabeth residents have realized over the last few years is that we've had our share of outages. So they've been hitting Cape Elizabeth fairly aggressively, Bob, you know, how much longer they're going to be around or are they just about wrapping up? About another week and a half. About another week and a half? Okay. Great. Thank you.
And any questions that could, you know, anyone can call CMP, but they, they, they're doing a, a pretty effective job at clearing the power lines. Great. Thank you very much. So let's, uh, before we go to the public hearing, just to have a little background. Um, the, um, this whole budget process, I just to kind of recap, the school board has had six meetings, the municipalities had four, there have been four other meetings where public comment has been welcomed. The town uh, council had a meeting on the 15th of April. And this uh, budget, this entire budget has been online on February 26th, 27th for those folks who are interested for their uh, ability to, to take a look at what's in the, in the budget and, and certainly direct whatever questions they wish to have to whomever they wish to ask. Um, so let's, without further ado, let's open up the public hearing for the proposed fiscal 2014 budget. And um, I'd ask if you wish to address the council that you do so at the podium and that you uh, limit your, um, your conversation to three minutes so that we can um, get as much in input from citizens as we can. I'd ask you to introduce yourself and your address uh, so that we can... Um, Make sure the record accurately reflects those folks who have um, decided to participate in tonight's hearing. And um, before we uh, before we do that, I've got finance chair is uh, Frank Avanelli, and I don't know whether he wishes to sort of uh, put some context around this evening. But uh, the, the uh, again, uh, appreciate all the work of all the department heads, both at the school level as well as in the municipality, as well as uh, the uh, elected board of the school and also here at the town council for all the, the, the efforts that have taken place because it clearly is a yeoman's job to put this kind of uh, product in front of us. I echo those remarks, uh, Jim. Um, it was, a, I think, an effective and efficient budget process this year. And um, the school board, I thought, made an excellent and very succinct and detailed presentation to the town council, which was uh, much appreciated as well. So this evening we're voting on the municipal budget special funds as well as uh, voting to send the school budget to uh, citizens for referendum on May 14th. Um, the overall, just to give a context to uh, the, the impact of the budget, the overall impact of these proposals is a, a proposed tax rate increase of 3.5% in total, which is based on um, an increase in the tax rate of $16.40 or a 56 cent increase on that. Um, so relative to what we're hearing from many other communities surrounding us, uh, the three and a half percent I think is reflective of um, strong efforts to keep costs in line as uh, despite uh, offsetting negative impacts on uh, some revenue line, line items overall. For the town and the schools and other uh, elements of the budget, total expenditures are um, proposed to increase 3.1% uh, against revenue increase of 1.1%, which net nets to a net to tax of a 3.6% increase. That's where we get it. So, Great. Well, thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. And just one more parameter for the discussion, if uh, you're going to address us, uh, we'd ask that uh, those of you in the audience would refrain from either any acclamation or otherwise comment or clapping or whatever. We just uh, would like to hear from you and we prefer not to divide the room, so to speak, if uh, with, uh, with the kind of uh, sometimes display of uh, interest that uh, may or may not be necessary. So, so if someone would like to address us, please step forward. Don't be bashful. Thank you. The last person in the room comes in first. That's good. FIFO or something. I'm Sarah McCall for Avon Road, 30 years here in Cape, and I'm commenting on the community services budget and specifically about the fitness center. And there's an allocation recommended by the school board to the town council, I believe, of $10,000. I think that figure is right. Um, I'm actually going to make it more of a broad comment, which is that I think we have a great idea here in Cape that fitness is very, very important for all age groups. And looking at what happened with the bike trail years and years ago with the Pedals and Pedestrians Committee, we were going to get federal money to build it. It was going to be two lights road as well as shore road. 
we turned it down, and I think we were right, probably, in turning it down, given what we know about our budget now, and given the fact that we have a bike path. So the kernel of our commitment was there. We knew it was appropriate to have um, some type of a usable path on Shore Road, although it didn't end up happening at two lights. So I'd like to suggest that the fitness center, from my opinion, in, in a much more global thought process would be that fitness in this town should be supported and subsidized by the taxpayers, just like it's done in school sports um, for people who are not in school. Frank um, Miles made that clear very eloquently when he addressed the school board earlier um, this year. And I'd like you to think about this commitment of a mere $10,000 as, yes, a subsidy by taxpayers, <coughs> but yes, in exactly the right direction. And I'm one that would be willing to help out in any way to take that idea of making additional commitments um, to the town for fitness. Perhaps the size and the exact amount isn't appropriate, but I think the commitment to fitness for people outside of the school age is. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Are you seeking public comment on all items? It's the entire budget. The entire yes. budget. Because yep. I would like to speak about the school budget, but Go right at ahead. the appropriate time. No, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. My name is uh, Ken Lane. I live at Five Beacon Lane. I've lived in the Cape for, well, this is my 29th year. I never thought I'd be standing up speaking on behalf of our youngest students as I approach uh, uh, an uncomfortable old age. But uh, I'm talking uh, on behalf today for the 90 families whose children are entering the fall 2013 kindergarten program, uh, many of whom are not here tonight because they have young children and are uh, in families. But uh, they, I can tell you I've talked to a number of them and they are concerned and surprised. Uh, they're concerned about the use of a lottery uh, to assign children to either a full day or a half day program. They are, uh, where the position they have is really a very fair position and equal, uh, a very uh, uh, appropriate position. They're asking that all the children be treated equally, either a full day for all, which uh, I will say in a minute I believe is eminently doable in a, in a budget neutral way, in a non-discriminatory budget neutral way or half day for all. Uh, what they're very concerned about is splitting the class into haves and have nots. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the uh, famous Harvard uh, case study, the Abilene Paradox. It's a teaching study and it emphasizes group dynamics and group think where a group of people end up in a place they don't want to be. I would suggest tonight that as a town and as a school, we're ending up in a place we don't want to be, where we're going to potentially leave a third of our youngest students in a critical foundation here behind. Now, what, why does this really matter? Uh, when you look at the research on full and half day kindergarten programs, the kids who are in the full day program are going to receive 40 to 50 percent more instruction time in critical foundational skills of reading, math, and literacy concepts. Uh, this is actually a huge deficit to overcome in later years. It sounds simple. We're all in Cape, we've always dealt with students who come in in the first grade at differing levels of ability and our teachers work very hard to bring everybody forward. We've never had a situation where two-thirds of the class were one half day, one half grade ahead. We've never done that. Uh, that'll have all kinds of unintended consequences. Uh, the research suggests that the full day program will have stronger readers for the first four years that they will, be, they will have better social skills, they will have better independent learning skills. It's really a very big disadvantage and for the life of us, 
we can't understand what's happening. And in spite of the best efforts of our teachers, and we do have great teachers, the research suggests that these children will not catch up to their full day peers in their first four years. So we're creating a group of haves and have-nots by lottery. That is uh, very surprising. I would like to just say this is really just a backdoor way of implementing a full day kindergarten program. Unfortunately, we believe that it is in a damaging and unequal manner that will have consequences. Today, in the state of Maine, 88% of all schools that offer a kindergarten program offer full day. Every community surrounding us offers full day, with the exception of, Portal, of, of Gorham. Every community. We're lagging behind. And I would just say that viewing a half-day program as a money-saving device is very short-sighted. The research suggests... Me, you could uh, wrap it up. We appreciate it. All right. It. Thank you. Uh, we have the money. The undesignated fund is expected to be over 416000 That could be used. We have 140000 of contingency item. Between those two, we have a half a million dollars, and we could afford one teaching so that everyone could do it. But the parents are asking for everyone, for all students to be treated equally. Full day for all, or if it's impossible, if it's a bridge too far, if we can't figure out in a $22.5 million budget how to get one teaching resource with the kind of contingent funds that are available, then let's do half day for all and wait till we can implement it fully. Thank you very much. Thank you, much. Mr. Lane. Appreciate that. Anyone else? Good evening. Frank Hannigan, 233 Spurwick Avenue. Uh, I'm here to speak in uh, part of the uh, community services special funds, uh, part of that budget, and the community services uh, fitness center. Uh, specifically uh, and they encourage you to accept that portion of the of that uh, proposal to fund that facility it's, it's a facility that's used by many people of all ages uh, there's plenty of room to incorporate more people in this community and outside of this community uh, to use this facility it's um, it's been put by the uh, wayside for quite some time hasn't had any attention paid to it and uh, I think in accepting this budget and, and uh, allowing us to go forward and try to create ways to bring in new members and such is uh, uh, very good for this community, both young and old. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Anyone else? Yes. Hi, um, my name's Janet Villiotti. I live at 7 Montgomery Terrace. I've lived in Cape Elizabeth for five years. Um, and uh, I would like to speak also on behalf of the fitness center line item in the community services budget. Um, I have, prior to this meeting, emailed every one of you town council members, and I hope um, that you all read your email. Um, and I was a little bit more detailed in what I had to say. Um, I also spoke at the school board um, meeting when we discussed um, the budget. And I would just say that I echo the sentiments of Sarah and that other nice gentleman who just spoke uh, in favor of it. In a $22.5 million budget, I think $10,000 is a drop in the bucket. And I know that in these economic times, every dollar counts to every person. And I also have a child in the schools. I know that um, there are many, many interests that are represented in our budget concerns. But I think that um, to treat the fitness center as something that can just be eliminated without giving it a chance to be marketed, a chance to be publicized, and a chance to really be made um, into more of an asset to our community, I think is a mistake. I think um, the value adds and the intangibles that the fitness center provides to the members of our community really can't be given a dollar amount. And I think that the quality of life aspect really can't be discounted in this um, particular situation. At the school board uh, workshop, it was laid out as um, 
a line item and present it as, well, I'm just going to take the heart right out of this and say that this is something that I see can, that can be eliminated. And if any of you had been at that workshop and seen the outpouring in terms of attendance, you would have been astounded at how many people were there. And I think with to counter that very sentiment, and I think that um, with the advent of spring sports and a few other things, the turnout isn't as great tonight, but I think that there are a lot of people watching this, this issue and I think it gives us a great opportunity to be examples to the younger members of our community, namely our children and the kids in our schools. Um, and I also think that for a lot of our older community members who no longer have children in schools, I think this is probably one of their greatest value adds. And I would encourage you to consider that and the um, benefits to everyone in our community. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Anyone else? Hi, uh, my name is Sarah Clausen, and I live at 67 Wood Road. Um, I have a five-year-old daughter that will be entering kindergarten in September. Um, I grew up in Cape Elizabeth. Um, I attended Pond Cove, and I have a degree in educational psychology. Um, I was shocked when I learned that the school board is endorsing a proposal to implement full-day kindergarten by lottery for somewhere between one half and two thirds of its students. I was disappointed to learn of this proposal because I know it will significantly damage uh, and disadvantage those children who receive half day. Um, in the Cape Elizabeth that I grew up in, this would be unacceptable. The research shows that full day kindergarten students will have academic advantage over their counterparts through fourth grade at least. Um, conversely, the half-day students may feel academically inferior simply because the school wants to pilot a program rather than do a full implementation. Uh, intentionally causing educational gaps between our youngest learners is unfair and damaging. Um, there is unanimous sentiment among parents and educators in CAPE that this step is unnecessary and that if full day cannot be done for all, then it shouldn't be done this year. Um, and so I respectfully ask that you reconsider the proposal for partial implementation of full day kindergarten and delay implementation until all students can participate. Do it the right way or don't do it at all. Um, I want you all to think of a six-year-old girl or boy entering first grade who's had half-day kindergarten, and 75% of their class is a full half-grade ahead of them. And think of how they feel when they can't read or write as well, not because they aren't capable. It's no fault of their own. It's, it's a poor decision made by the school. And they're going to feel frustrated that they're going to be struggling for years to catch up with this group of people. And how is that going to make them feel about school and learning? OK, we can avoid this scenario from becoming reality and do the right thing. We're asking for equal opportunity for all Cape Elizabeth kindergartners. Make it fair. Either we have full day kindergarten for everyone or half day kindergarten for everyone. Cape Elizabeth is not about discrimination. Do it right. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Anyone else who wishes to address us? A lot of folks out there. That's pretty. Okay, uh, seeing no one else who wishes to address us for this uh, public hearing on the proposed 2014 budget, I'll call the public hearing closed and move to the first item on today's agenda, which is item 63. And these are draft motions based on the amounts that have been set for today's public hearing. And I believe in the packets that you folks have in front of you, as well as what's been on the website. So. Um, Moving along here, I would uh, entertain a uh, motion on the first item. Frank? I move to adopt uh, item 63, 2013, uh, the municipal budget as stated in our agenda. 
Do I have a second? Second. Second, David. Any, any discussion on this first item? No? Any uh, comments from the manager? No? Okay. Hearing, um, hearing nothing. Yeah, I, I do. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just <laughs> want to you. remind everyone yes, that this municipal budget is contemplated on uh, the suggestion that the governor's budget to eliminate revenue sharing will not pass. Uh, if the if the budget passed with the elimination of revenue sharing, this budget would have a six hundred forty thousand dollar gap. So. Uh, it, we, we're going to have to watch uh, issues very closely in, in Augusta this month. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? Unanimous. Item number 64. We need to obtain a motion on the approval for the Cumberland County Assessment. Uh, Frank, you're going to do the heavy lifting. I'll do the heavy lifting, yeah. I yeah. uh, move that we had that uh, item 64-213. Uh, we uh, move that we approve the Cumberland County assessment as laid out in our agenda. I have a second. Second. Second, Jamie. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? Opposed? Unanimous. Number 65, the approval of the local homestead exemption funds. Do I hear a motion? Jessica? I move that we approve item 65, 2013, approval of local homestead exemption funds. I have a second. 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 David, thank you. Any discussion? Is this another item that we have to watch the state, the homestead exemption? Yes. That's, a, that's also on the, uh, on the agenda at the legislative level. So, okay. All those in favor? All those opposed, it's unanimous. Number 66, the approval of the community services budget, special funds budget. Hear a motion. Frank. I move that uh, we approve the community services special funds budget, uh, item 66, 2013. Do I hear a second? Second. Kathy, any discussion on the Community Services Special Fund Budget. Yes, David. And, and to be clear, this proposed special funds budget includes the $10,000 allocation for the fitness center? Yes. Okay. It does. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Any, um, any further discussion on this? All those in favor? Oh, you, you had a question, sir. Yeah, I just had a question, and yeah. maybe, you know, this was discussed and I missed it. I know I, I read the director's report of this, you know, uh, <coughs> this assessment and um, request for uh, additional funding, hoping to increase membership with the card swipe system. Was there any discussion of increasing the membership cost? Do you know? Well, we have the Director of Community Services here, so if you wanted to join us up at the podium for a second and just answer that question, if you could. Good evening. The answer to that question is no. You can introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, I'm Not, sorry. Russell Packett. Since you're, you are <laughs> relatively new in that role, we, thank you. Some, some of us know who you are. But. Okay, thank you. Russell Packett, Director of Community Services. Um, at this time, there has been no discussion about an increase in membership fees, primarily because if you compare our fees to surrounding options, where we are exceedingly higher than other options. So we're trying to do this in a different way. And I want to clarify for everybody that really this, the additional funds that, was, uh, that we've asked for is not, I don't want it to seem like it's subsidizing the operation of the fitness center. It's more of a way to help us with the capital issues that we're having, and that's equipment more than anything else. So. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Does that Thank answer you. your question, Jessica? Yes. Any, any further questions? Okay. Thank you very right. much. No Appreciate it. All those in favor of item 66? All those opposed? Carries unanimously. Item 67, the property tax levy limit. I hear a motion. Move Frank. that we approve the uh, property tax levy limit as laid out in item 67, 2013. Seconded. Jessica? Second. Thank you. Any questions about this? No? 
All those, any discussion? No? Okay. All those in favor? All those opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. Item 68, the school budget approval. Um, I hear a motion. Jessica. Uh, I move that we approve item 68, 2013, the school budget approval. So uh, I need a second, please. Frank seconded. So this is quite a lengthy um, section, Michael, for direction. Do we need to read into the record each of the cost center summaries, or how do you? The, the, the record will show, show it approved uh, in its entirety unless there's an amendment. <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> All right, is there any discussion about this item? Yes, uh, Jamie. I just want to say I appreciated the comments of Ms. Clausen and Mr. Lane, uh, and I, I thought about this carefully, and I talked with some school board members about this, and I shared similar concerns that you had about this, and, and I still share them. Um, that being said, I, I did appreciate the responses of the school board and the superintendent, and I want you to know that the council has thought about it carefully. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, Frank. Um, also talking about the kindergarten, I think the. Um, <clears throat> I do appreciate the points of view on this, uh, both for the proposal and against the proposal. But I, I look at it from a slightly different perspective, which is that this is, a, this is a curriculum decision by the school board, a policy decision by the school board. And as town council, we're re reviewing the budget. We're not reviewing each individual curriculum decision. And therefore, I think that um, while the input from the community is extremely important, it's really important to the school board as they assess program priorities going through. Okay. When I look to the council here, um, uh, I, my conversation with John Christie, who is the chairman of the school board, that he would be more than happy to address us this evening on this issue if it would be the, the will of the council. He, he, he simply, you know, indicated he'd be more than happy to step up and sort of talk a little bit about this, the subject if it's important. If I look at the group, I don't I mean, John, yeah, David? It, and I share uh, the views that have been expressed by Frank and Jamie. Uh, this is a curriculum decision. Yep. We as a council do not sit here and make and second guess uh, mm -hmm. curriculum programming decisions made by the school board. I mean, I, I think of years when maybe Latin was on the chopping block and, and if, if that had actually come to pass and the budget came to the town council, would I then have voted against the overall budget because I felt mm -hmm. that G Latin should stay in it? And the answer to that, would have been no. I still would have voted to approve the budget if I thought the overall budget was reasonable uh, and was not asking too much of citizens in terms of a, a potential tax increase given the programming decisions that have been made. Uh, the only reason why I think it would, might be helpful to hear from John or others on the school board or the superintendent is we have heard a lot of concerns raised. I don't know that that's not necessarily going to influence my vote tonight. I plan to vote in favor of sending this to the voters um, in mm -hmm. May. But it might be helpful to, in this forum to hear responses to, to some of these concerns. But uh, you know, I'm willing to be outvoted on that okay. sentiment. I just so you know, I don't necessarily. I, I think I see a consensus. Yes, yeah, Jessica. I wanted to add something. Um, I also agree with my fellow counselors in that this is a curriculum decision. Um, I would um, uh, like to point out that, um, and I've had this. We had this discussion in a workshop. Uh, and I'm referencing this Mr. Lane's um, <clears throat> information. There, there is research that shows that in a community of, of demographics such as ours, that children do catch up by third grade. Um, so there, you know, there's controversy in that field. But I think that um, overall, it seems to me, given the rest of Cumberland County, um, you know, all-day <coughs> kindergarten is something that is looming forward, going forward. And, uh, and, and we, we, we had a very informational workshop with the school board, and I thought that their reasoning for piloting this was very measured and thoughtful. And so I, I was very impressed with that. And, and again, I'm, I'm not willing to second guess the curriculum of our curriculum experts. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. So I, I guess either Meredith or John, if you just wanted to give us a few comments. I mean, I, again, I, I think it's out of respect for the feedback that we've received in this hearing today. And if it would, uh, I, I just want to be 
be clear that it's all about making sure that we're, we're citizens and, and, and community members and neighbors, and we're all trying to do the right thing for our kids. So, John, thank you. Thank you. I'm John Christie, and I'm the chairperson of the school board. And um, I, I, we've, we've, you, you all have given us a lot of your time already to, to listen to our budget. So I'd be happy to answer um, any questions that people have. But um, by way of uh, a, a, an overview, as, as, as we looked at resources at, at uh, Pond Cove School, we saw an opportunity partway through the budget process, not, not, right up, not up front. Uh, but as we looked at resources, we saw an opportunity to, um, to re reallocate a resource toward kindergarten and therefore um, pilot a full day kindergarten program. Uh, I don't think that we would be piloting this program if we didn't believe um, strongly that it will be successful. Um, but uh, we're piloting it for a number of reasons. First of all, we, we don't fully know the extent of parental interest in the program, and we'll, we're gathering that information now. Uh, but we have had parents who've come to us um, and said that they hope that their children may continue to have a choice of half-day kindergarten. So had we come to you with a proposal for um, for full-day kindergarten for all students, uh, we might have a different group of parents here tonight lamenting the loss of half-day kindergarten. So whenever we make programmatic changes, um, it can produce uh, some anxiety around, you know, what, what's that going to mean for students? And obviously with the youngest students, um, you know, that, that can be profound. So um, second of all, we don't have the funding. Um, I think you all are familiar with our budget process. Uh, we've cut uh, 5.3 full-time staff positions from our budget, and um, uh, we and we still have, uh, or still waiting for final information from the state. Um, and final information from the state, which we expect in June, is never final. In two out of the last six years, we've had significant um, mid-year curtailments. Um, totaling $200,000 last year and over $600,000 three or four years ago. So uh, even when we, th we think we know what our revenue picture looks like, um, we don't always fully know. So, and the other thing I, that I would mention is just to speak to the, um, to the, to the, to the issue of fairness. Um, in, in Pond Cove, in first, second, and third grades, um, fully 90% of our students are proficient in reading and math um, in each of those years. Uh, that's a very good number, 90%. That puts Cape Elizabeth at the top of the state. Um, but I think that, and I think the school board thinks that there's an opportunity for us to do better. And so we're really looking at, and we began to look at those 10% of students in each of those grades who are not meeting grade level proficiency and at what we can do to address that. And, and one of the best tools that we have in our toolbox to address those kids is full day kindergarten and other early childhood interventions. Um, and so when I look at this as a fairness issue, what I'm looking at is our opportunity to decrease that number, that 10% of students in first, second, and third grade who are not meeting grade level proficiency and this is what this is what full day kindergarten we hope will give us and um, hope and I think next you know by the end of uh, or by, the, by by next year we'll have more information um, about how that's worked out but that's that's that is part of our goal in in piloting this program John could you just clear up the numbers please um, Sarah Clausen talked about 75 percent a third you know two-thirds could you could you give me the I mean what we're talking 88 we're looking at 88 kindergartners next year is that well we don't well we don't know project because um, not a, you, some families don't register for kindergarten until Labor Day um, we, we kindergarten's the hardest class size to predict because those kids haven't been with us mm -hmm. um, the year before so our plan is for hundred kindergarten students that's what our budget looks at um, the school board guideline on class size for kindergarten is 18 students. Um, and so uh, that's at 100 students, that's about six sections of students. So that, that would give, and we have budgeted for four teachers. So that would give us um, two pilot sections of uh, full day kindergarten and um, four 
normal half day uh, sections. Um, if we have fewer students, um, or if parents express different uh, preferences when they register their preferences with us, uh, we, we can take a, you know, another look at that. Um, but that's what our plan is for. It's for 100 students okay. um, and four teachers. Okay, because some of the email traffic that we received this week at least talked about a third section of full day. Uh, at least it was alluded to in the... So yeah. if uh, we had 90 students, that would be five sections of students. And if, uh, if there were enough parents express, expressing a preference for full day kindergarten to justify three sections of full day kindergarten, we would potentially be able to do that. Um, and have two, and so with four teachers, would have we could have three full day sections and two ha two half day sections. Sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Joe. So I appreciate that. Any uh, questions? Yes, David. Uh, John, uh, is there any concern uh, among the school board or the administration that if you don't take one step forward in the coming year, that it will be all that more difficult two years from now to implement a full day kindergarten for all incoming students? Uh, I, I think given the fact that we're facing declining enrollment, enrollment's down, um, I hope I'll get my numbers right, enrollment's down about 11% since, um, since five years ago. Um, and at the same time, uh, state revenue is down over those same five years by 35%. I think given that pressure um, and, and the cost of, of some of our big drivers, uh, such as health care, um, and energy continues to, to, to rise faster than inflation. Um, I think it's very difficult um, to look at, at program expansions. W is, it, is it impossible? No, but it's, it's, it is more difficult. So um, I, 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 think it, I think it might be a more challenging task to, to, to come forward with a budget that was in the future that was, um, you know, we want to add two or three teachers uh, next year in order to expand kindergarten. Jessica? Would, <clears throat> in the advent, let's just say hypothetically, of full day kindergarten, would that be voluntary? And would half day kindergarten be voluntary? Uh, I can't answer hypothetical questions. I, I, we would, we would uh, and, and I don't mean to be dismissive of the question, but we, um, uh, I would look to the, to the superintendent and the administrator of Pond Cove um, for what they felt. Um, was the right uh, thing to do. I mean, I, you know, there are parents, I certainly was one that would not have wanted full-time kindergarten. I, you know, and I really would not have. Um, so I'm just hoping that whatever goes forward, that option remains. Um, I, I, any other questions? Yeah, I don't know. Anyone? Yes, David. The, the sort of the theme here is fairness, and a few of the commentators tonight talk about how you know, how is a kid going to feel when he, he or she is a full half grade behind when they enter the first grade? You know, how, how does the school board or the administration respond to that well, sentiment? Well, currently we have about um, between 10, 10 and 20 percent of the class every year enters from private full day kindergarten programs, enters first grade. Um, so we have experience already with differentiating our instruction in first grade to address different levels of preparation. Um, aside from the preparation they get at school, kids come with different levels of preparation um, at home. And um, so, and yet, again, 90% of those kids by the end of first grade are at, at or better than grade level proficiency for first grade. So we, we would address it by addressing it the same way we do now, which is tailoring our instruction to meet the needs of the child. Good. Thank you, John. I'm, you know, Thank you for volunteering to, to, uh, to speak to us again. I sure. appreciate the, the, the conversations we're having, keeping ourselves communicating one another with what's taking place. So I, I hear any other further discussion, any questions? Then I think we'll take a vote. All those in favor and all those opposed, it is unanimous. Moving on to item number 69, the proposed fiscal 2014 general fund budget summary motion. Do I hear a motion? Jessica. Um, 
<clears throat> I move that we approve item 69, 2013, the proposed fiscal year 2014 general fund budget summary motion. Do I hear a second? Second. Second, Jamie. Any discussion? All those in favor? Unanimous. There's nobody opposed. A procedural motion is recommended to consider item 70 through 84 as a block. So I would entertain a motion. Uh, just David. Uh, I move that we consider item 70 through 84 on block. I hear a second. Frank, thank you. All those, uh, any, any questions, any concerns? Yes, Jessica. Now this, if I see our agenda correctly, this is our last item for the evening. This uh, uh, last budget vote item. Yes, there's oh, one more. The warrant. The warrant. The warrant for school budget vote. Okay. But, well, I just have a few words I'd like to express, but I'll wait until we get down to the warrant vote. Yeah. Go ahead, Caitlin. Go ahead. We're just we're taking the budget and block to 84, and it doesn't go to 84. I was just curious. Mm. That must be a typo. Well, that goes to it looks like 78. Seven. <laughs> well, I was looking for 84. Didn't find it either. So is it meant to go somewhere? Last year's worth 84. Yeah, I bet it did. I, <laughs> 77. So uh, would you, uh, David, would you amend your uh, amendment? It should end at uh, 77, right? Yes. I just was testing you all to make sure. <laughs> uh, good, good, good. So so good. Item 70 through 77 Seven. on block. Okay, and the second, are you willing to accept that amendment? Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin, for pointing that out. Appreciate it. It's so all the lawyers are on the side of the table. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, are you all set? You're okay. Um, any any discussion about these items? No. Okay. And I take a vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Again, item 78: the approval of the warrant for a school board uh, budget vote, or rather, school budget vote on May 14, 2013. And you can see uh, the detail in front of you. And this includes obviously a vote yes or no on the upcoming year, as well as an advisory question, too high, acceptable, too low. And then a third piece that relates to continuing the budget validation referendum process in Cape Elizabeth for an additional three years. Yes or no? Do I hear a motion? <coughs> David? I move to approve the uh, uh, warrant as set forth in our materials. Second. Okay. Um, did, uh, let's see, any, any conversation or discussion, questions? Deb, did you want to say anything about the, the details on this? Uh, if you'd like, I'd be happy to. Sure, if you would, that'd be um, great, just to clear up any. Yeah, just to clear up, if this is approved tonight for the warrant, it does call for the May 14th election, it would be at the high school gymnasium. Uh, absentee ballots would be available beginning tomorrow morning um, during regular business hours at the town office. We will also have information on the website. Uh, the last date of vote absentee would be Thursday prior to the election because there is a Thursday prior to an election deadline for absentee ballots. And I believe that that uh, date is Thursday, May 9th. So again, absentee balloting beginning tomorrow morning through Thursday, May 9th, right here in the town office uh, during our regular business hours. Very good. Any, uh, any questions about the, yes. Jeff. Well, I'd like to say a few words of would this be the appropriate time before the vote? Sure. For the warrant. Go ahead. Um, for the very first time I've been on the town council, I'll be supporting the school budget. <laughs> so um, so, you, you, so I'd like you want that in the record. I, <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah. So, so it's taken you four years. I think, I think it's noteworthy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> John, it was your speech a few minutes ago. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I would like to say a few words, and I'm supporting both budgets with reservations, but I, there are some things that concern me that are looming in the next several years. Um, both the municipal and school department heads have worked very hard this year to hold down costs. I will focus briefly on the school budget and my concerns <laughs> for the future, as the school department costs are approximately, if I'm correct, about 70% of our entire town budget, or maybe, or it might be 69% or 70, anyway, close enough. And, uh, you know, we're looking at the possibility, ultimately, of funding full day kindergarten. Um, I think the school department worked very hard. They had an, an additional unexpected mandate of $300,000 
cost of teacher retirement. This has been the unfunded liability at the state level, and those chickens are coming home to roost locally. And, uh, you know, it's very concerning. Um, and we continually lose money with the school funding formula. One of our greatest costs is health care. And members of this school department and our school board and this town council worked very hard to force the MEA to release statistical data, thereby allowing other health insurance companies to bid competitively, which would ultimately potentially save school boards across the state hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and obviously, those savings could be used in the classroom. There is a bill now in Augusta, LD 300, that would prevent this from happening. And so I'm, I'm hoping this bill fails. And I would urge everyone to call their local uh, legislators because, again, this is a tremendous and unknown cost to us. I recently attended a meeting for municipal officials. And the featured speaker was Dr. Charles Kogan of the Muskie School, and arguably Maine's leading economist. Dr. Kogan's optimistic projection is that Maine, for many reasons, may not see any significant relief from this great recession t until at least 2016. And he stressed that this was his optimistic view. <laughs> we have been, and we will be for some time with, this, uh, with our, our budget and, and our, even our personal budgets, um, dealing with this new reality of great fiscal challenge with cuts from Augusta. Our officials here locally have worked very hard, but you know, where do we draw the line? Is our municipal government to be everything to every citizen for every citizen's want? And that's what worries me. I mean, I'm, I'm voting in favor of our budgets, but, you know, we continually are, are, are asked for things that are wants and not always needs. Um, Within our school department and, and our, our also our municipal department, do we, do we tell our citizens that they have to increasingly pay for everything that everybody wants? And we also, again, we have declining enrollment with our schools. And, um, and we're looking at funding more programs. And while I agree that kindergarten is, is a, apparently the standard throughout full day kindergarten, this still begs the question, how many more programs for declining enrollment? We've got to control our spending. So I'm, I urge us all to be mindful of these concerns, and I would like to challenge myself and my fellow counselors and school board members to work hard for a zero budget increase for two, fiscal year 2014. I think that Cape Elizabeth taxpayers deserve a break. So I want to work very hard for that goal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so before we take a vote, any other counselors wish to address the group? David? Uh, you know, I think we share a lot of common views on the, on the town council, and sometimes we vote against each other. But what I really enjoy about this group is that we uh, do so in a civil manner. And I'm very pleased to see that Jessica tonight, I did fall, almost fall off my chair based on her prior votes, but I'm very pleased to see her thoughtfully considering the issue. And I, I'm not prepared to make a pledge uh, to have a 0% tax increase next year, but I think it's certainly something that you know, we have to consider and we have to work hard to make sure that we keep our spending in check. And I think that's a goal that every council and every school board shares year to year. Uh, and I've been impressed both with this group, but especially the school board uh, since I've been on the council. Now as a senior member of the council, um, I've just been very impressed every year with the school board and the commitment they bring to our community. So I want to thank them for their hard work and also uh, uh, I'm very pleased to, for the record to vote in favor of, of the budgets tonight. And the, hope, hopefully the public will support the validation vote. Good. Okay, so let's, uh, what's in front of us is, this, uh, is the approval of warrant for a school budget vote on May 14, 2013. All those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Then we have the last item on our agenda, and that is a citizen's opportunity, second opportunity to discuss items that were not on today's agenda. Are there any citizens in the audience who wish to address us on this? Doesn't appear that way. Okay. So the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Frank made the motion. Who would like to second it? Second. Second, David. All those in favor, adjourn it. All those opposed, unanimous. Thank you very much. And good evening, everyone. <laughs>